Okay, now we're going to get into statics. Statics is a relatively brief unit, and it's usually not done as a, a you'll not you won't see it as a problem done by itself, but often it's part of another problem. Or sometimes there's a multiple choice question, but even with that, you don't see a ton of this. But it's still important to know how to do these problems. So, as always, if you enjoy this content, uh, give us a like and subscribe. So, statics is defined as when the net torque and the net force are zero, but also there's no translation. So, net force means that there's no, when, there, when the net force is zero, that means the acceleration is zero. But an object could be at rest or it could be moving at a constant velocity. We're defining this not just that the acceleration is zero, but that it's not moving at all. And that the net torque is zero means that alpha is zero, which could mean not rotating or rotating at a constant angular velocity, but we're saying it's not even allowed to do that. So the net torque is also zero. So when you have these two conditions met, you have the condition of static equilibrium. So let's go ahead and solve a problem so you can see how this works. So let's say we have a long beam that has a pivot. Now this pivot is sometimes called a fulcrum. So we have a kid that's standing on one end of this beam that's 100 kilograms. And you can see that to be able to balance this, we need to be able to put um, another kid on the other side. And the question is, how much is the mass of this other kid? Okay? And the mass of the beam is 40 kilograms. So the beam has mass as well. And the questions are the mass of the kid and the force on the pivot. So since the net torque is zero, we can do this as a torque problem to start. So that would be I alpha equals. And then we have to pick a point that we're going to use to rotate that about. So the place that would make the most sense is the pivot. Because if we choose this as our origin, this makes this go to zero. And then we only have one unknown. So that's going to be minus F of the first kid, we can call that F1 down, times the radius, R, from the pivot, plus the force normal, because the pivot's exerting a force normal, times the radius, then plus the force due to the weight of the beam that acts at the center of mass, times R, plus the mass of the kid that's unknown, uh, mg of the kid times the radius. So to throw some numbers in here, it's not angularly accelerating, so that's zero. And then we have minus 100 times 9.8 for the first kid. And he's at a radius of one meter. Now you can think of that as negative if you want, negative one meter, because we're going to the left. Plus Fn is at the origin, so that's zero, so this cancels out. Plus Fg of the center of mass, so that's going to be 40 times 9.8, and that's one meter from the fulcrum. Plus the mass of the unknown kid times 9.8 times 3 meters. And uh, solving for M, you end up with an M of 20 kilograms. So that's the mass of the other kid. I don't know how realistic this is as a really small kid. Okay, now to find the force on the fulcrum, we can do a net force equation. So we write F net equals MA equals, and then we sum up all of the forces. So we're doing the forces in the Y direction here. We could even write Y if we want to. Um, so that's going to be minus 100 times 9.8, so that's the first kid. Then the force normal, which is acting up. Then the beam, which is acting down. And then the kid that we just found out, that kid's acting down. So that's minus again. And when you do the math on that, you get a force normal equal to 1568 newtons. It came out positive, which makes sense because it's up. This is kind of a classic uh, 
um, statics problem where we have a beam that sticks out and normally this would be like something where you have a sign hanging in front of a shop and then there's a cable or a cord that's connected to the wall up here that's helping to support the beam. So we're given that the beam mass is 25 kilograms and that theta is 30 degrees and they want us to find the force on the hinge. Now if you can think about this, this cable is, is pulling in this direction so it's sort of driving this beam in so the hinge is pushing back out and the hinge has to push in both the x and the y direction. So they want us to find that f um, hx and that fhy and then also the tension in the cord. So let's go ahead and set this up as a net torque equation but before we do that let's just draw a diagram to label out all of the forces. So this force is easy that's the force of the hanging weight then we have the force of the beam which we'll call fb and that's just the weight at the center of mass then we have the force of tension due to the cable, and that's at angle theta. And then we have the force of the hinge that is at some other angle we'll call phi, and we'll just call that force of the hinge, but they want us to find the x and y components of that, which won't be too much of a problem. So before we can do a net torque equation, we have to decide what we're going to do this about. What's going to be our origin? Well, the way that these static problems work is by choosing an origin at something that we don't know, it enables us to get rid of one of the unknowns. So if we choose our origin to be here, that becomes zero. and We don't have to worry about the hinge, and then we can solve for the force of tension. So we have I alpha, and then that's going to be minus the force of the beam. Oh, I defined clockwise as negative. So the force of the beam is trying to rotate it in this direction. So that's going to be um, minus the force of the beam um, times 1.1 meters, because it's halfway out minus the force of the weight, because that's also trying to make it go clockwise, and that's at 2.2 meters. And then we have plus force of the tension in the y direction uh, times 2.2. So we're only going to deal with this force, we're not going to deal with the x direction. So we know that this drops out to zero. So we have zero equals minus 25, the mass of the beam, times 9.8, because that's the force, at 1.1 meters, minus, and then I don't think I told you what the mass was here. The mass is 280 kilograms. So that's minus 280 times 9.8 times 1.1 minus, uh, force of tension y, oh, that's that's 2.2, sorry, because that's all the way out at the end, minus um, force of tension y, which is also at 2.2 meters. So when you do the math on that, we only have one unknown. We can solve for force of tension y, which comes out to 2,866.5 newtons. Now, if we want to find FTX, that's easy, because now we know this component, all we have to do is find this component. So we can do um, both force of tension, because we have a side and an angle, and we can also do the side that's miss missing, the FTX. So how do we do that? That's just going to be sine 30 is equal to FTY over FT, and when you put the numbers in for FTY, that comes out to a force of tension of 5733 newtons. And then to do the other side, the FTX, we'll do the same thing except with cosine since we're finding the adjacent side. So that's our FTX over FT, and our FTX comes out to 4 964.9 newtons and that's acting to the left because we have our FTY is up 
Our FT is this way and our FTX is this way. Now, it should make sense that if our FTX is this way and it's the only force in the X direction, that FHX has to be equal to that same value and we'll be able to use that um, in a lower step here. So now, let's go and solve for the force of the hinge in the Y direction. So to do that, we can't choose this to be our origin anymore because then FHY would go to zero. So we're gonna choose and switch origins and do this over here. And this time I'm gonna call clockwise to be positive. So we're doing the sum of the torques about the right end this time, right end, and that's equal to I alpha, which is gonna be zero. And then that's gonna be the force of the hinge in the Y direction times 2.2 meters. That's positive because I define clockwise as positive. And then minus the force of the beam that's acting at 1.1 meters. So this drops out to zero and um, the force of the hinge Y is FHY. The force of the beam is gonna be 25 times 9.8, because that's the mass. And uh, when you do that, you end up with a force of the hinge Y as positive 122.5 Newtons, which tells us that it's up, and that's what we would expect. Now, because we did this before and we found, whoops, the force of tension X, we know that that has to be also equal to the force of the hinge X. So for that part, all we have to do is just write force of the, hin force of the hinge X is equal to 4964.9 Newtons. So we're done with that. So now to find the total force on the hinge, um, we can set up a little triangle here. And we have the 122.5 that we solve for the up, and we solve for the x, which is the 496.4 Newtons. And to do that, you can just do a squared plus b squared equals c squared, and that will give you the resultant value here, which is the total force on the hinge. And I'm not gonna put the numbers in. You can see how to do that pretty easily. That comes out to 4966.4 Newtons. And then finally, to get the angle phi, all we have to do, we have many choices here. I did tangent, tangent of phi equals the opposite over adjacent. So that's the 122.5 divided by the 4964.9 that we just solved for as our hinge in the x direction. When you do that, you get a phi value of 1.4 degrees. Okay, this is a very common problem. It's the idea of a ladder against the wall. In this case, it's a beam of mass 12 kilograms. We're given the lengths of the, the ground and the wall where it makes contact here. And it's going to be pushing up against the wall. So the wall is gonna be pushing back against the ladder. And because the wall is a surface, the force normal has to act perpendicular to that. So that's gonna to be to the left. And down here we have friction because without friction, this beam would slide down. So there's friction acting this way. And we'll see in a minute that the friction this direction has to be equal to the force normal of the wall in this direction because there's no other forces acting in the X plane. Then we have the force normal of the ground acting up on this. But there's one more force, which is the force of gravity acting down on the center of mass. Now, we're not going to do this problem but there's another popular problem where someone climbs up the ladder and you figure out how high up they go before it slips. Well, in that problem, you're gonna find the force of static friction max here, and you're just gonna add in the person producing torque on the height that they climbed. When I say height, that's gonna be the distance from rotation and the force of that person perpendicular. So. Let's go ahead and do this more basic problem. And what I did was, I started out by drawing a free body diagram. So we have the force of the wall, the force of friction, the force normal, and mg. 
And then we need to go ahead and figure out um, the force in the x direction. So you're going to see here in a second that we can actually skip this step, but that's going to be fx equals ma equals minus force of the wall, because the wall is pushing to the left, plus force of friction in the x direction to the right, and this equals zero. So what have we done? All we've done here is prove that the force of friction in the right direction equals the force of the wall in the left direction. So you can actually skip that if you can see that. So now let's do the force in the y direction. So in this case, we have MA, which it's a statics problem, so this is zero, and that's gonna be the force normal acting up minus the weight of the beam acting down. So again, we can see that the force normal must be equal to the weight of the beam. Okay, now we can do the torque. Now, we have to choose a point. Well, we have some unknowns here. We have the unknown of Fn. Actually, we, we've got Fn because it's Mg, so we could solve for that. But we have FF is an unknown and force of wall is an unknown. So to do that, we are going to do the torques about this end so we can get rid of our FF and just look at the other torques. So we're going to do this about the bottom. And that's going to be I alpha is equal to minus mg times 1.5. Now, we've got to be careful here because that is the force that's perpendicular to this distance, which is three meters. So we can do the force that's perpendicular to the radius, but we could also do it this way, where we have the weight of the person and do this distance and multiply that by half of this radius, which would be 2.5. Either way you do it, whether you use the component that's perpendicular to this radius, or you use this force perpendicular to this radius, you'll get the same answer. So, um, and the reason that I point that out is because if a person climbs up the ladder, it makes more sense to either find this force this way at that radius r rather than to figure this out. But you could do it backwards and you would end up getting the same answer. So we have minus mg times 1.5, that's the center of mass. And then we have plus the force of the wall times the four meters. So when you do that, you get a force of the wall is equal to minus 44 newtons. And we know that the friction is the same value, so we just solve for something else um, in the same step. Okay, so now to find the force normal, we know the force normal is equal to the weight. So that's an easy one. We just say Fn equals mg equals, and then that's just going to be 12 times 9.8, so the force normal is equal to 118 newtons. Now, to find the resultant force due to the ground, so that's going to be the friction of the ground and the force normal due to the ground, that's going to be some new force that's acting here at some angle that we don't know. So what is that? That's going to be the 118 up and the 44 to the right. So that's going to give us a new force F here that we can solve for um, using uh, sine and cosine, or we could also use uh, Pythagorean theorem. And that comes out to 126 Newtons. And we can use sine, cosine, or tangent. Any of those will work to get the angle, which comes out to 70 degrees. This is another common problem. I didn't draw this perfectly, but the lengths of these strings are the same and the angles are the same, so it's supposed to be like that. But um, we have a six kilogram weight hanging and these are 
cords and this is a ceiling or a roof or something like that. And the question is to find the force of tension in the cords. So the first thing that I did was to break it apart. Now, if this angle 60 is here, we have alternate interior angles, so this angle is also 60. And we have the force of tension acting up, and so the components of FT1X and FT2X are opposite each other, and they have to be equal to cancel each other out. Now, we could write an F net X equation to prove that, but I think at this point you've seen enough of these that we can skip that step and we can just say FT1X has to be equal to FT2X. Now, if these were different angles, like this was 60 and this was 30, that would not be true, and we'll do one of those after this. So in the y direction, you can probably already see this, that these two components are going to be equal to each other, but that the sum of these have to add up to cancel out the FG. So what does that look like? Well, that's going to be the sum of the forces in the y equals ma, and that's going to cancel to zero, and that's going to be equal to FT1 sine 60, because we're finding the vertical component, plus FT2 sine 60, and then minus the weight that's hanging there. So that's going to be minus FG. So we can bring this to the other side, and that will give us 6 times 9.8. And because the forces are equal, we can say 2FT sine 60. And solving for the force of tension, that gives us 34 newtons. This one's easy because the two angles were the same. What if we used the same angles, but we used angles that were smaller? So, for example, we did something like this, where now the angles are 30 degrees and 30 degrees. What do you think would happen to the tension in the string? So it's going to be the same thing, 6 kilograms, and the only thing that we've changed in this equation is the angle. So we can use this same equation over again and say that 6 times 9.8 is equal to 2FT, but this time it's sine of 30 degrees. So when you do that, the force of tension comes out to 58.8 newtons. Now, think about why this is. As we start to make our angle smaller, this component starts to get smaller. So we have to pull harder to be able to generate enough force to cancel this force, which means these horizontal components get very large as well. So the total force and the force of tension starts to approach infinity as these angles get closer and closer to zero. If they were hanging perfectly straight up and down and the angles were 90 degrees, then this force would end up being exactly double uh, this, these two forces doubled would equal this force down here. A popular multiple choice question is to ask which tension, um, tension T1 or T2, is larger. And once we do this problem, you'll be able to see which one it is and why. So let's do it with numbers. So if we say we have the sum of the forces in the x direction equals ma, that's going to equal negative FT1, and I'm going to shortcut a little bit here because you can see that that adjacent side is going to be cosine. So that's going to be cos 30 plus FT2 on the other side. That's going to be the adjacent side, but that side is cosine. So we end up with FT2 cos 60 is equal to FT1 cos 30. 30. I'm just adding it to the other side. And if we put in our cos 60 and cos 30 and divide, we get FT2 is equal to 1.73 FT1. So now what we can do is an FTY. So we do sum of FTY equals, uh, sorry, 
sum of the forces of the y, which are FTYs, um, is equal to MA, which goes to zero, and that's going to be FT1. This time we're using the vertical, so that's going to be sine, and they're both positive because they're both up, so that's going to be FT2 sine 60, and what forces do we have acting down? Just the hanging weight, which is minus 100. Now, we have one equation with two unknowns, but we can use this equation right here to sub in for FT2. And when you do that, we're going to add the 100 to the other side, so that gives us 100 is equal to 0.5, that's the sine of 30, 0.5 times FT1 plus the sine of 60, which is 0.866, times the 1.73 FT1 that we're subbing in. And when you do that, you get a force of tension 1 of 50 newtons. Now, to be able to solve for force tension 2, we don't have to do this all over again. We could, but we don't have to, because we have an equation for FT2. We can just say FT2 is equal to 1.73 FT1, so that FT2, subbing in that 50 newtons, is equal to 1.73 times 50, or our FT2 is equal to 86.6 newtons. So when we look at this, we have this low angle and then this steep angle, and we have the 100 newtons. This is the 50, the lower angle one, it, whoops, newtons, 50 newtons, and this is our larger one, eight, the 86.6, because more of this is acting in the direction that it's canceling out this force. So the sharper angle one, the 60 degree one, ends up becoming the larger force, and the shallow angle ends up being the lower force. This is an interesting problem because it's uh, a statics problem, but it's mixed with some friction. So what we have here is a block that's sitting on a surface with friction and it's on the verge of slipping. So we know this is going to be equal to the force of friction static at its maximum value. Then we have a block that's acting just straight down and then we have a cord that's acting at 30 degrees that's attached to a wall. And the question is to find mu s of this block. So we can treat it as a statics problem and break up our forces. So we have our FT1 in this direction, which is going to be equal to the force of friction. Then we have our force T2, which is going to be the tension. And then we just have the weight hanging straight down, which is mg. So in the y direction, we can say F net y equals ma, that crosses out to zero. Then we have the force of gravity down, so that's minus 5 times 9.8, plus the force of tension in the y direction, so that's going to be Ft2, I brought this over, and that Ft2 is going to be sine theta, so we have uh, whoops, sorry, cosine theta, it's the adjacent side, FT2 cos theta, and that gives us a force of tension of 56.6. So now we know the mg and we know the FT2. So all we have to do is an FTx to find this. So in the x direction we have ma crosses out to zero, minus our FT1 that we know is the force of friction, plus the force of tension 2 in the x direction, so that's going to be FT2 sine this time, sine 30, and when we solve for FT1, bring this to the other side, and multiply through by the sine of 30, we get 28.3. And we know that this force of tension is the force of friction. So we can put in our 28.3 is equal to mu s, and the force normal is the normal force of the 10 kilogram block, so that's 10 times 9.8. And solving for mu, we end up with a value of 0.29.